Let me just share the screen to make sure it's working. Is my screen okay, Ole? Or Steve? Yep, looks fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep, it's good. Okay, we have 41 participants and they are joining, still joining. So I will give it a, a minute or two just to everyone to join. Okay, so let's start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, if you're joining us from the UK and good day, uh, if you're joining us from any other parts of the world. Uh, my name is Homan Takhtechian and I'm uh, the current i Aberdeen Committee Branch. Uh, welcome to our March technical program, which is a presentation by uh, from the University of Manchester. Uh, Please note that this webinar is going to be, is, is actually recorded at the moment uh, and uh, will be available later on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to watch it again or you want to uh, forward it to other uh, people who couldn't attend. Uh, also, please note that if you have uh, any questions from our uh, presenter today, you can ask it on the Q&A section at the bottom of the page. Uh, Dr. Oli, uh, who is our vice chair, uh, will go through the question at the end of the session. Uh, as you know, uh, as you probably have seen from the event flyer uh, today, uh, presentation is by uh, Dr. Robert uh, Lindsay from the University of Manchester. The topic is uh, corrosion inhibition, separating fact from fiction. Uh, before I uh, give it back to, to Dr. Uh, Lindsay for, for the presentation, I will just have a quick uh, introduction about uh, ICOR Aberdeen uh, Future Program. Uh, a quick uh, thanks for, uh, from all our branch sponsors who have kindly supported us regularly during the last uh, couple of years, especially the COVID time so we could uh, continue with our uh, regular programs. Uh, also, uh, thank you for all uh, i core Aberdeen Committee members uh, who have helped me uh, and uh, helped the, the committee to, uh, to arrange for all of these uh, events, uh, different events that we are running at the same time. Uh, if you have any question, any uh, queries, please feel free to contact any of us uh, as you see the, the names on the screen or simply just send an email uh, to icorabz at uh, gmail.com or just uh, send to admin at icor.com. Uh, so we will uh, respond to, to your queries. Uh, just a reminder that all the slides from like 20, 
15, as you see on this screen, are available on uh, our uh, website, the ICOR Aberdeen website, and also you have the news and the presentations, the latest presentation on the main ICOR webpage, uh, Aberdeen branch page. And also, if you're looking for any other presentation from other branches, you can uh, explore uh, the slides and the uh, news from uh, in other, other parts of the uh, website for the other branches. The YouTube channel is also available. It's, uh, I think at the moment we have dozens of uh, presentations uploaded there. Uh, you can go back and uh, watch the previous ones as well. Uh, just a note about the future programs. Uh, for this year, we have two more, apart from the, this evening's uh, presentation, we have two more presentation uh, left uh, for the 2021-2022 uh, program. Uh, the next one, uh, which will be the first face-to-face -face meeting after two years time, uh, will be uh, by Preserve uh, company, uh, a joint meeting with AMPP, uh, former NACE. Uh, and this is going to be in uh, juries in city center, Aberdeen city center uh, hotel uh, on the 26th of uh, April. Uh, the next one will be in, as usual as the previous events, it will be in Palm Court Hotel uh, on 20 and uh, 31st of May. Uh, the date uh, still need to be confirmed by the speaker, but uh, most probably that will be the date. Uh, again, both of these are face-to-face, -face, but we are planning to uh, live stream all the events, uh, uh, broadcast uh, on Zoom, same as, uh, as what we are doing right now. So if you are not based in Aberdeen, you can uh, follow the uh, Zoom registration and watch it online and ask a question, any question from the speakers online. Uh, and again, the... Uh, the presentation will be recorded and will be online uh, available on YouTube channel. Uh, and in August uh, this year, we will have our usual annual corrosion forum. Uh, this year, the theme is the uh, role of material selection, corrosion management and asset integrity management in the energy transition and net zero targets. Uh, so that's that's what's left from the 2021-2022. But just a reminder that for next year uh, branch program, we already have sent the call for speakers. Uh, you should already have received an email uh, about that if your email is registered with us. If not, please send us an email and uh, ask uh, so we can include your email in our uh, correspondences. Uh, also, you can, uh, if you haven't received any email and you want to just apply for that, uh, once this uh, presentation is finished, uh, when you're leaving Zoom, uh, there will be a survey. So in the survey, you can uh, enter your uh, queries or the, the details of the topics that you want to, to present with your email address. So we will come back to you and contact you. Uh, the deadline, for the next year program abstracts uh, is end of April. Uh, and uh, we are going to decide about the selected uh, presentations by the end of May. For the annual corrosion forum, we are also at the moment looking for uh, speakers uh, and a sponsor for the sponsor for the venue. So, uh, again, if you are interested in any topics related to energy transition, renewable energy, and net zero, uh, just contact us and uh, or uh, fill the survey form uh, after the event. Uh, just an update about the Young Engineer Program, which is at the moment um, happening. So we already had our second uh, uh, second uh, presentation or second meeting with uh, 
with our team. So the first one was, as you see, the virtual one uh, that we had in January and uh, the introduction and course and the course uh, about the coercion, fundamentals of coercion by Steve Patterson. And the uh, second one, Stephen Tate uh, did a presentation about the integrity management, which was in sub C7 offices. Um, both, both BP and sub C7 have already sponsored the, the event. It's still the event is open for more sponsors uh, or for future years uh, program sponsorship. So if you're interested in any of the areas uh, sponsoring the event, speaking at the event, uh, mentoring, uh, just give us a shot. Uh, we will uh, try to include you in the program. If you are interested in as a young engineer to participate in the future program, just uh, uh, wait for, for the next announcement, which will be next year. Uh, this is a biannual uh, uh, program, as you might know. Uh, so then the next one will be in London. So uh, if you're based in uh, London or England, so you will, uh, maybe we, you, are interest, you will be interested to uh, attend uh, this program as well. Uh, so th that's me with the short introduction about uh, what's happening in uh, ICOR Aberdeen. Uh, so with that, I will pass it to uh, Dr. Lindsay for his presentation. Uh, just uh, one uh, while he is just sharing the screen, I will just give a short uh, introduction about uh, uh, Dr. L uh, Robert Lindsay. Uh, he is a reader in uh, Corrigion Science and Engineering at the University of Manchester. Uh, let me stop sharing so you can, yeah. Uh, prior to taking up this position in 2005, he had appointments at a number of other research institutions, including the Fritz Haber Institute Berlin, uh, Cambridge University and the CSIC Institute of Material in Barcelona. He has more than 30 years of research experience with more than 80 published articles. Uh, Rob's research uh, activity focuses on mechanistic understanding of interface properties of relevance uh, to corrosion. He combines electrochemical measurements with surface sensitive probes such as X-ray, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy to develop a structure performance relationships to enable more complete understanding of corrosion related phenomena qualifications. Uh, he has a bachelor in uh, chemistry, University of Bristol at uh, 1989 and a PhD in surface science, uh, University of Liverpool at uh, 1992. Three. Uh, with that, I invite Rob to uh, do the presentation. But just before that, I would like to run a poll, uh, which uh, Rob wanted to to ask a couple of questions about from the audience. Uh, so I will launch the first one, and I give it like uh, 15, 20 seconds uh, for the audience to answer. Uh, so. The first one is, uh, the question is, do you know much about characterization techniques for corrosion inhibition? And you have three choices to select. We have 71 participants today at the moment and 54 already answered. Okay. Just a couple of more seconds and I'm ending this poll and share the results. So 
7% uh, say I'm an expert in corrosion inhibitor characterization. 66% uh, know a little about uh, corrosion inhibitor characterization. And 27% uh, are new to corrosion inhibitor characterization. Uh, the other question I'm launching as well. Uh, do you employ corrosion inhibitors as part of your jobs? Okay, we have 60 answers just now and sharing the results. Uh, so 17% employed them on a daily basis, 35% uh, every so often, and 48% not involved with employing corrosion inhibitors. Okay, uh, interesting results. Uh, I will just... Uh, with that, I invite uh, Rob to start the presentation and I, I can see already the slides are on the screen. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for the invitation. I just make it thanking everybody for the invitation to come and speak here. And it was very useful at uh, the poll, so that gave me a feel for what to speak. And I hope, uh, so as being said in my sort of bio, that I don't work in industry, I work in academia. and. I'm not applying corrosion inhibitors in industrial situations, but I'm hoping you're going to see that we're trying to understand how they behave, how they work better. And uh, following the introduction, I'll show you some of our, our research. So as I've as it said, I've called the uh, title talk corrosion inhibit inhibition separating fact from fiction. Now let me just move to the next. Okay, before we uh, go on to any more details, I just want to establish that Corrosion inhibitors, or CIs for short, are applied in a, a variety of different applications. And I'll just show you some examples here. They can be incorporated into the paint of uh, cars, for example, or into, into reinforced concrete to prevent corrosion of the rebar uh, in, in the reinforced concrete. They can be more traditionally employed where there's large amounts of aqueous solution. So obviously in the oil and gas industry, they are very widely employed. And also in other chemical processing. So here on the left-hand side, this is uh, acid bath for removing mill scale from uh, uh, metal sheets before going on for uh, painting and processing. And here, the, uh, the acid bath, which is hi uh, highly concentrated sulfuric acid, is inhibited to prevent the corrosion of the metal. And also in the more unexpected areas, you might find them. So, for example, in, uh, in museums, there might be a, a corrosion inhibitor, either what's called a vapor phase inhibitor or applied as a wax, for instance, to this suit of armor. And quite recently, actually, we've been doing some work with Manchester Museum looking at corrosion inhibition of a, uh, a Japanese bronze in incense burner that was uh, constructed in the 18th and 19th century. So this is an active area as well. Also, some of you may not know how long they've been applied. So this just demonstrates they've been around for a long, long while. So this abstract comes from the Journal of the Chemical Society uh, all the way back in 1872. And they're reporting work, and forgive me for pronouncing it wrong, in a publication called Il Nuevo Cemento. Uh, and these two characters here, Marangoni and Stefanelli, did some work uh, where they were looking at uh, hydrogen evolution, so corrosion in sulfuric acid on zinc, and they were adding various oils, such as myrtle and thyme, and they were reducing the corrosion rate. They don't mention the word corrosion inhibition here, but that's probably likely what is going on here, that they're inhibiting something's forming on the surface and inhibiting these processes. So it's been around for a long time and very widely applied. So just what are corrosion inhibitors? And I have a definition here. It's modified from the NACE or AMP definition. So a corrosion inhibitor is a substance then when added in a small quantity to a normally corrosive environment, it reduces the corrosion rate 
by bringing around a, a change at or near the metal surface without significantly changing the concentration of corrosive species. So it's just shown this cartoon here. This is at t equals zero seconds. And if we just let it corrode in the solution, then a corrosion layer builds up. If we add our inhibitor CI, then we perform this, we form this protective layer at the surface, some sort of barrier that slows down the corrosion rate. I'm going to investigate more what these look like. An important aspect of a corrosion inhibitors is, of course, is how well they perform, how much they reduce the corrosion rate. And a particular widely used figure of merit for measuring this performance is inhibition efficiency. And it's given by this equation here, where U is the uninhibited corrosion rate and I is the inhibited corrosion rate. All divided by U, multiplied by 100 to get a percentage, and you want it to get to as close as 100% to be as effective corrosion inhibitor as possible. And typically, it's usually considered that an efficiency over 95% would say that corrosion inhibitor is working well. This is somewhat uh, artificial level, but that's typically accepted in many uh, areas. And so in that case, the corrosion rate will be 1 20th of the rate without the inhibitor. And we'll come back and use that later on. So there isn't just one type of corrosion inhibitor. There's various ways you can classify corrosion inhibitors. So they might form a two or 3D type of film, and I'll come back to that in a moment. They can be organic or inorganic substances. So that's just descriptive of what type of reagents you're using. They might interfere with different parts of the corrosion process, either the anodic, cathodic, or both uh, half reactions, corrosion half reactions and some are either anodic, cathodic, or mixed type inhibitors. They can be either oxidizing or non-oxidizing, and that's referring to situations where there's oxygen, so more near neutral conditions, where there's oxygen in the solution driving the corrosion. It depends whether or not the, the inhibitor requires that oxygen to function or not. And finally, there's ones that are described as either safe or dangerous, and that's nothing to do with whether they're explosive or they're toxic, that means when you change the concentration of the corrosion inhibitor, does the corrosion rate decrease and increase gradually? So increase gradually as you reduce it, or does it go through a sudden step? If it goes through a sudden step upwards, that's called a dangerous type inhibitor because you must be much more wary of slight variations in concentration. And of course, no inhibitor is just one of these classifications. So you could have a 2D film forming organic inhibitor that was mixed type inhibitor, for example. So these are various classifications. And as regards to surface film, I mentioned already on that last slide, there's two basic types. There's either a 2D absorbed film, so very thin layer, one or two molecules thick, whether it's strictly 2D is another matter, but that's what's commonly called. And they're typically found to form at low pHs in acidic type solutions. You get thicker films commonly, uh, 3D films, they can be numbers of nanometers thick, up to microns in, in some cases, and they're more typically in aerated near neutral solutions. What I'm going to focus on this evening is the work we've done in this area on 2D films in acidic solutions. So just to start with, just to remind you what an acidic environment looks like in terms of electrochemistry. So here we have one molar hydrochloric acid, uh, a strong acid, a low pH. Uh, the metal here, I just said, is iron. It could be carbon steel. We'll be focusing on carbon steel in this talk. And we have two parts of the corrosion. We have our anodic oxidation of the iron, Fe going to Fe2+. Plus. And at the cathode, in this case, the main reaction is reduction of protons to form hydrogen molecules. And the inhibitor needs to uh, interfere with one or more of these reactions, either the cathodic or the anodic reactions, or both, which would be a mixed type inhibitor. So this slide just shows you a bit more detail what's going on, or what we think is going on in an acidic environment. So here's a typical sort of molecule we might add as a corrosion inhibitor in an acidic environment. It's an organic molecule, and it has a so-called head group that's interacting with the surface. Oops. Sorry, I think I've lost, just one second. I've lost my uh, pink window. 
So, can you see, is it still showing the slides? Yes, yes it is. Sorry, yeah, it just flipped for me. So you have a head and a tail group, and the head group interacts with the surface. Uh, and the typical sort of surfactant molecules, we'll come back to that in a moment. And here, the molecules are inserted into the acidic solution. They form, as I said, a 2D layer on the surface. Looking in more detail at this layer, these are cartoon models of what might be going on. So on the right-hand side, we're forming a model layer, single layer of molecules on the surface. Alternatively, they could be forming a bilayer as shown on the left, rather than a single layer, they might be forming a bilayer as shown here. And these yellow circles and arrows are, the, are there to indicate that the layer is dynamic, okay? It's forming and reforming all the time. If you reduce the concentration of molecules in the solution, typically the concentration and the molecules at the surface will reduce quite rapidly. So you have to have, you have, to have this dynamic equilibrium between the bulk solution and the surface to get this uh, inhibitor layer on, unless you have long, uh, large degree of persistency where molecules can last for a longer time on the surface. So let's have a look. So what about practical selection of inhibitors? Well, that's shown on the right-hand side. What is typically done uh, by many people in the industry in uh, engineering scenarios where the corrosivity is reviewed, and then potential inhibitors, candidate inhibitors, are, are selected based either on the user's experience or supplier's knowledge. On that basis, a number are selected, then a series of tests are done, some basic screening tests. And then for the ones that are better performing, there'll be advanced testing to make sure they're functioning. And then to go on to field trials and then to deploy if everything is OK. And if they're not, there's these series of sort of loops to go around and repeat. Essentially, this is an empirical process involving trial and error. And I have to say that it is indeed very successful because, as I already said, they're wi very widely used successfully in industry. But if we want to push on and get even better inhibitors or to work in different environments or in different ways, then we need to do some research, try and understand what's going on. And to push the field forward, there's numbers of current areas of research efforts. I've just uh, highlighted a few here. There's quite a lot of people working on absorption thermodynamics, how strongly the molecules that are corrosion inhibiting bind to the surface and getting some thermodynamic quantities out. And I'll come to discuss that and the value of that later on. More recently, there's uh, now been a big push in fashion for AI and also machine learning to try and use machine learning, try and select out uh, candidate corrosion inhibitors that will perform well. This is very much in the early stages. They'll use various sort of descriptions of the molecule, the uh, homo-lumo gap, the number of OH groups, the number of CO groups, etc. And they'll put that information in and try and teach the, uh, the software, uh, the algorithms, to search out for good corrosion inhibitors, likely candidates are going to perform well. As I say, this is in very early stages. It's it doesn't can't discriminate that well at the moment, but I think there's a, a big future for this sort of work going forward. There's also interface characterization, and that's what we do. It's a bottom-up approach, trying to understand what's happening at the molecular scale. And it, for instance, this work, this is uh, calculations, atomic scale calculations done by Anton Kolkal from Slovenia, where he's looking at the interaction here with benzotriazole with a surface of copper in this case, uh, and looking how this inhibitor molecule, which is well known as inhibitor, interacts with the surface. There's also experimental work, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a moment. Finally, there's a big push for green corrosion inhibitors, and if I have time, I'm going to make a few comments on that at the end. So I'm going to begin by showing you some of our recent work on interface characterization. Now, I think it helps us to propel our knowledge, mechanistic knowledge of how these molecules work, and hopefully allows us to then have a way of selecting better molecules and also helps guide modelers as input for their uh, work to select realistic interfaces to try and look at how corrosion inhibitors function to select them. 
So the work I'm going to be describing certainly wasn't done by uh, me alone. And in fact, if it was only me, there wouldn't be much of a talk, but it's been contributed by a number of people uh, over several years now, a number of years now uh, that have worked in my group. And I'd like to particularly pick out Kieran, who the majority of this work I'm going to be talking about uh, formed part of her PhD. So what's our research goal? So we're not really trying to find new corrosion inhibitors in our research. We're trying to understand how current corrosion inhibitors work in a lot more detail. So we can move away from this empirical selection process. And to summarize what we're doing, which, so this is a cartoon I've shown before, where we're forming this model out of the surface, but is this, is this just a cartoon or is it anywhere close to reality? For example, a key point is, are the molecules really absorbing on a clean, salt-free and oxide-free surface under acidic conditions? Or as some literature suggests, are they absorbed on top of a thin layer of oxides or salts on the surface? And that's the sort of thing we want to know, because that would be really useful input for modelling, for example, and to be able to select inhibitors for specific situations. And we have quite a, a large experimental toolbox to do this work. So in terms of determining the corrosion rate, we use electrochemical measurements such as linear polarization resistance, LPR, or, and or PDP, potentially dynamic polarization, to characterize what's going on electrochemically. And sometimes we also use weight loss measurements to complement the electrochemistry. But then in tandem with that, to get this structure performance uh, relationship to build correlations between the two, we use a toolbox of characterization techniques and these, some of these are shown here. For instance, in the solution, we're using surface tensiometer to determine what's called the critical micelle concentration. And perhaps we're also using UV vis or infrared to look at solution species. At the interface itself, to characterize that, we use another number of techniques. For instance, we use SCM electron microscopy to look at substrate morphology. And we use several other techniques, including XPS, which stands for X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, that gives you information about the interface chemistry. And I want to focus on this in this talk, so I'm going to just give you an introduction to what XPS can tell you. So this shows you the basics of XPS. So in XPS, you have uh, impingent X-rays onto the surface of the sample, and that's a monocratic beam, so it has a single energy, these beams, this beam of X-rays, and it ejects electrons out of atoms in the surface layers. And so out of different electron core levels in the surface and generates these electrons called photoelectrons, which we can then count the number of them depending on their kinetic energy. And we get a spectra that look a bit like this typically. So here's the intensity, that's the number of photoelectrons and the binding energy is how strongly they're bound to the atom. And we get peaks on a background, series of peaks on a background. And these peaks can give you, where these peaks sit, can give you an idea of what is at the surface in terms of its elemental composition. So is there carbon there? Is there iron there? Or is there nitrogen, for example? Also, it can tell you more details. It can tell you the chemical composition. For example, for iron, it can tell you whether it's metallic iron, or it's iron that's oxidized to Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus. And to emphasize that this is a highly surface sensitive technique, so it's well suited to looking at thin layers of corrosion inhibitors, monolayers or bilayers, because it only probes the top few nanometers of the surface. So we're really getting surface information here. Now, a key part of our work is a specifics about the methodology, our approach. So here is uh, the XPS facility at Manchester that we typically use. It's a Kratos XPS facility. And the key thing for our work is this glove box that's attached here. And for our experiments, this is filled with nitrogen. And what we do is we remove the sample out of the inhibited solution into this nitrogen filled glove box. So it's not exposed to the laboratory air. So it's not oxidized. Many people have done this work, uh, which we believe is compromised because it's oxidized following the immersion. And that's demonstrated here for this. So this molecule here, 
which I'll come back to later, is mercaptomidazole. It's a well-known corrosion inhibitor in acidic conditions, and it performs really well. And we've uh, looked at that uh, with it, uh, taking the sample out from a fully purged glove box and put it into the spectrometer, or from a partially purged glove box. That means there's some oxygen. And the important point to notice is that if we're not fully purged, we get ionic iron, Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, whereas we only see metallic iron if it's fully purged. So Fe0. And that's showing that there's post-immersion oxidation. And that's also shown in these oxygen peaks here where we still see oxides, where it's minus, if we're not fully purged. And we don't see those peaks there when it is fully purged. So that's an important point. This methodology is being really important for us to get really into the details of these interfaces. So let me move to the first system of interest that I'm going to talk about uh, primarily uh, this evening. So this is uh, the substrate is carbon steel. So we're inhibiting carbon steel in the presence of a molecule called OMID for short, because the chemical name is rather long. So we call it OMID. And this is shown here. It is a uh, imidazoline, it has an imidazoline head group and this long alkyl tail. So the head group in more detail is shown here. So it consists of three different nitrogens, one called imine, one a tertiary amine and one a primary amine. And you come back to why that's important later. So this is the head group. Now, this is a surfactant type molecule. I, it has a head group that's polar and a long uh, non-polar tail group. And so they, they exhibit this property in bulk solution called micell formation. So there's a critical micell concentration. That's shown in this cartoon here. As you increase the concentration of the surfactant, in this case, the omid, from left to right, then initially, below a certain concentration, each of these molecules in the solution is just wandering around essentially on its own. But if you exceed the critical micell concentration, then you get these uh, spheres formed usually of collections of these molecules where the alkyl tails are sticking inwards because it's a polar solvent, uh, the water with the hydrochloric acid in it, and the head groups are sticking outwards. Now, this is important for corrosion inhibition because quite typically people say, if you're at the CMC, this is where the molecule works well. Okay. So it's a good uh, starting point for understanding what's going on, at least, at least to start with, and we'll come to that shortly. So let me first of all demonstrate something about the performance of this corrosion inhibitor. So we've, in this case, it's carbon steel, and we're in one molar hydrochloric acid. We've immersed a sample for four hours. We usually do four hour immersion experiments because that's convenient for our work. And that gives you enough time for the system to come to st steady state. So the open circuit potential is stable. And the temperature is around room temperature here. These show potential dynamic polarization curves. And just to note the critical micell concentration in this case is 0.18 approximately millimolar. So in these data here, we're going up almost to a critical micelle concentration. So you expect the inhibitor to be working well here. Now, just I'm not going to go into detail about these PDP curves, except to say that they explain, they give you information about the cathodic and anodic reactions and any changes. And if we look, as we increase the corrosion inhibitor, there's not much change in the slope. So there's not much change in the chemistry going on. Also, the potential doesn't change very much changes within 50 millivolts, and that's considered a mixed inhibitor. So the, the OMID in the, under these conditions acting as a mixed inhibitor is acting on both the anodic and cathodic reactions. And to be honest, quite typically under these sort of acidic conditions, most organic corrosion inhibitors are mixed type inhibitors. Just a stress for anyone who uh, does measurements similar to this, we do not determine the corrosion rate from these PDP curves because we're concerned that we perturb the potential so much that we, are, we might be getting uh, incorrect corrosion rate measurements. And we use linear polarization resistance for that. Qualitatively, what happens? So without the inhibitor, this is after four hours in one molar hydrochloric acid, you could see a roughened surface. So this is a SEM image, 20 micron. So you can see a roughened surface, there's no localized corrosion, just general roughening of the surface. 
But in the presence of near CMC, so 0.1 millimolar omid, you can see it's a much flatter surface. And these lines, actually, you see there's very slight etching, but they're essentially polished marks, and the polished surface would look very similar. So qualitatively, we are inhibiting and reducing the corrosion rate. And in fact, if you looked at this surface optically, it would just look like a polished surface before we'd started. So let's look a bit more quantitatively now at how well this molecule is working. Now here, what I'm plotting is corrosion rate on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, this inhibition efficiency, which is going between zero and 100%. We've measured this, the corrosion rate is from LPR, so linear polarization resistance, and the immersion and temperature conditions as per the last slide. So you can see as the corrosion rate goes down, goes close to zero, so it's asymptotic uh, going towards zero. Of course, the efficiency, inhibition efficiency is a mirror of that, and it's going upwards towards 100%. CMC, which is here, critical my cell, is about 97%, but you can see actually, even an order of magnitude below the CMC, we're already getting the molecule to work very well, and this line here is 95%. So in this case, you don't really have to be at CMC uh, for it to work well, but it does work well at CMC. And we're going to be focusing on that in the latter, in the latter part when I'm characterizing these uh, systems. So let's look now at characterization of carbon steel, one molar hydrochloric acid plus omid. Here we have uh, some overview spectra that I show uh, here on the left hand side. So these are wide scans, XPS scans. First of all, of the polished surface, so that's prior to immersion in the sample. The next one up is without any inhibitor, so just in the one molar hydrochloric acid. And the top one is with the hydrochloric acid plus the omid at CMC. So I just want to highlight a couple of things. So first of all, if we look at the... Why oh, that's not working? Just one second. So here we have... The oxygen signal. So that's the oxygen signal showing what oxygen is at the surface. And we can see this quite a lot at the surface initially uh, on the polished surface. And that's because iron in air forms a thin oxide film quite very rapidly on the surface. So it's a thin oxide layer. When we immerse it in solution, it's reduced a lot. And once it's inhibited, it's, it's rather small indeed. I'll explain what's going on there in a moment. As well as that, we also see the appearance of a nitrogen signal, which comes more intense once we have it at CMC, the inhibitor, which remember contains three different nitrogen atoms. So let's look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side show, is showing this nitrogen 1S core level in more detail. So the signal from the nitrogen atoms at the surface. You can see the polished surface is flat. We don't see any nitrogen. We see two small bumps, two small peaks, in not without any inhibitor there. And that's because of enrichment of elements uh, within the sample as it corrodes. So nitrogen is just enriched slightly at the surface. So that's why we see something. But then once we get a bigger peak, once it's well inhibited, so that suggests the molecule is clearly absorbing onto the surface. And we fitted this, this overall peak with five individual components, five individual peaks. Now you might be a bit surprised at that, because remember, I just told you before, there's three different nitrogens in this molecule. So why do we have five peaks? Well, hopefully now I'm going to be able to convince you that we have a, a reasonable case for why we fitted with five peaks. And this was not a simple process. It took rather a long time. So the first thing to understand is what the state of the molecule is in solution. So what's its degree of protonation? <coughs> So we've used online software called Chemicalize from Chemaxon to do these uh, calculations. It's very simple to do. And what we found was as you change the pH from above 10, where you have a neutral molecule, to below seven, you go through a singly protonated state and then to a doubly protonated molecule. So in the bulk solution of one molar HCl, where the pH is approximately zero, then we have a doubly protonated species in solution. So that helps us interpret the nitrogen 1S profile. And before I go into details of explaining how we interpret it, I'm just going to give you the answer 
because that makes things easier. So what we believe is this molecule is going down onto the surface on the base of the nitrogen one S signal and forming two singly protonated species, one where the imine nitrogen is protonated, and that's the primary species, and this lighter blue one where the primary amine is protonated, this is the minority species on the surface. So there's two singly protonated species on the surface. Let me try and take you through our interpretation that justifies that of the nitrogen 1S signal. So this central peak is due to this tertiary amine nitrogen, which is common to both. Now that's never protonated. So that's both the molecules on the surface have that. If we look now at the dark blue molecule with the imine protonated, we have two other signals, the imine protonated imine and the, uh, <clears throat> and the amine, primary amine that's here and here. And they're equal intensity and they're slightly less intense than the central peak. So that suggests those two. And then as regards this one, these outer two peaks are the tertiary, uh, sorry, the primary amine protonated and the unprotonated imine. So we've taken account of all those peaks and the intensities are consistent uh, with this interpretation. So in summary, the absorbed state looks like this, going doubly protonated in bulk solution and going down into two singly protonated states with the one on the left-hand side being the primary species. However, I haven't told you anything about what the surface looks like at this point. What does this interface look like? Because that's also important. What are the molecules absorbing onto? To do that, we need to look at different core levels. So we're looking at the iron, the oxygen, the chlorine signals now. These are similar stack of spectra, so polished without any inhibitor and with a CMC of inhibitor. These are the, this is the iron spectrum. And what you see from the polished sample, you see a peak that we assign to metallic iron that's here. And then these other peaks are due to either Fe3 plus or Fe2 plus iron at the surface. What's important you can see is once you're inhibited at CMC, we no longer see Fe3 plus or 2 plus. So these molecules are absorbing onto, we believe, a, a film-free surface. It's not essentially clean, but there's no ox thin oxide layer or no thin salt layer there consistent containing iron ions. If we look at the oxygen signal now, that's consistent with it because the oxygen signal has oxide and OH, and they'll be moved as soon as you put it into the acid with or without the inhibitor. O1 and O2 and O3, they're due to adventitious uh, carbon and oxygen containing molecules that absorb from the atmosphere, even in the nitrogen glove box. And they're not related to the system. You just can't avoid those under these conditions. <clears throat> One surprising thing, though, is although we have no oxides in the zero millimolar corrosion inhibitor where we just got hydrochloric acid, we still see Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus. So why is that? Well, the reason is if we look at the chlorine signal, we see a strong chlorine signal, which we can assign to a chlorine salt. So what we formed is a thin layer of iron chloride at the surface. You can think of that as the dynamic corroding layer. This is lost when we go to the inhibited system. We do see a small chlorine signal, but actually it's no longer salt. We believe, strongly believe this is absorbed chlorine atoms on the surface, which are required for the molecule, the only to work well, but they're not forming a thin layer. They're just singly absorbed atoms. So this shows you how we think this interface evolves. I've already talked about it being two singly protonated species, but it's about gas or substrate. We start on the left-hand side with our polished substrate where we have an iron oxide hydroxide layer. In one molar hydrochloric acid without any omid, there's an interface, the oxide of hydroxide is, is replaced by a thin layer of iron chloride. And then as you go towards CMC, there's no iron chloride left and the molecules are absorbed, the omid in these two differently singly protonated states along with absorbed chlorine atoms. So this is what the interface looks like. So that's all very well. So that's hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid can be th thought of as really a prototypical acid that's used in these corrosion inhibitor studies, if you look in the literature. What happens if we vary the, the concentration 
and also the acid uh, identity itself. And that's what we've done here. We've done a vet series of measurements, all at, with, without inhibitor and with inhibitor at CMC, one mole of hydrochloric acid, 0.01 hydrochloric acid, then one mole and 0.01 mole of sulfuric acid. I'm not going to go through the whole table, but I just want to compare now the one molar hydrochloric acid to the 0.01 molar sulfuric acid. And we've selected this for comparison <coughs> because the, the inhibition efficiency is still above 95% and the corrosion rate is still rather low, 0.2 as opposed to 0.1. The one molar sulfuric acid is quite high, it's still one molar, and that might interfere, interfere with our results. So we've avoided that one for now. So <coughs> I've just shown this cartoon here. We know what happens with one molar hydrochloric acid with omid at CMC, we have the molecules absorbing on metallic iron in the presence of these absorbed chlorine atoms in these two singly protonated states. What we want to find out is the same going on in sulfuric acid or is something different? So let's look at the overview spectra first. So here I'm showing a polished sample as shown before, the one molar hydrochloric acid with omid at CMC and then in 0.01 molar sulfuric acid with omid and CMC. And you can see the spectra look different. For example, you can see a significant increase in the oxygen signal compared to the inhibited uh, system carbon steel in the one molar hydrochloric acid. And also you see nitrogen signal again. In fact, it's a bit more intense in the uh, sulfuric acid. If we look in more detail in the, in the nitrogen signal shown here, and I'm comparing I've normalized the heights and comparing the 0.01 molar sulfuric acid to the one molar hydrochloric acid. You see a shift in the peak, in the binding energy of the peak. And we have tried assiduously to try and fit the 0.1 molar uh, nitrogen signal, 0.01 molar sulfuric acid nitrogen signal with the same five peaks that we did for hydrochloric acid. And we find that we can't do it with any physically reasonable interpretation. We've also searched for other options, such as doubly protonated species of surface. And currently, we have no idea exactly what the state is of the molecule at the surface. So, somewhat disappointingly, but still nevertheless valuable, that it's not the same as hydrochloric acid, but we're not sure. That's why it's a bit foggy here. So what about the interface itself? What about the substrate termination? <clears throat> so again, we're relying on iron, oxygen, in this case, sulfur uh, signals, and looking at their profiles, look at this substrate. Here I'm comparing data from 0.01 molar sulfuric acid with the data we've already shown, already shown for one molar hydrochloric acid, both with omid and CMC. If you remember, in terms of the iron signal, we just saw metallic iron, whereas a key difference here for the sulfuric acid, we see strong signals, in particular, uh, due to Fe3+, plus, we also see some Fe3+, plus, but the main signal is from Fe3+. Plus. So it's no longer metallic iron at the surface, but it's some sort of salt or oxide. If we look at the oxygen 1S signal, we have this intense peak here, which we can assign through comparison with the literature to the oxygen in sulfate, SO4 2 minus. Then if we look at the sulfur signal, we see actually two peaks, and they're doublets, but don't worry about that, two features that are due to sulfate in slightly different chemical states. So what we believe on interpreting these data is that we've, we're forming a thin layer of ferric, so Fe3 plus sulfate at the surface, and that's shown in this cartoon here. So the molecules are absorbed in some sort of state, but we're not sure what, on not a, a film free surface here, but a thin layer of ferric sulfate that's sitting on top of the metallic iron or carbon steel. So why is that? So here, I just, so it must be the energetics, but why, why is it different? So this is a bit of a hand-waving argument, which is one idea that we have. So here we have the one molar hydrochloric acid with omid absorbed, molecules absorbed onto the clean uh, metallic surface of carbon steel with chlorine atoms. Whereas here we have this ferric sulfate like layer. And looking in the literature, and as many of you will know, that in very concentrated sulfuric acid, then you can passivate the surface actually with ferrous sulfate. So this is 
corrode, this is from 1964 in corrosion science from Heinz et al, where the corrosion rate plummets down at around nine molar, so 63% concentrated sulfuric acid. And so what we think is possibly that these omin molecules are inducing a stabilizing layer, in this case, of ferric sulfate. So just as if, just as uh, in highly concentrated systems, we can, of sulfuric acid, we can passivate the carbon steel. Here, we're forming a pseudo passive system by forming a hybrid layer of iron sulfate and these molecules. Of course, in hydrochloric acid, this passivation doesn't occur. So the mechanism might be a little different. So just to summarize this part of the talk, I've shown that the absorption of the omid is acid dependent. So either it's two singly protonated states in the hydrochloric acid, and we're unsure what's going on in sulfuric acid, but also the substrate depend, depends on the acid as well. And we've shown quite different substrate determination. So these interfaces are quite different. And we believe that this is, provides key information, as I say here, for knowledge-based development of next generation corrosion inhibitors. So I'd like to move on now and talk a little bit about the work, that's an extensive amount of work that's been done on absorption thermodynamics and my take on that. So the idea in this uh, absorption thermodynamic work on corrosion inhibitors is that they take the efficiency and go through a series of calculations to drag out, to calculate the standard Gibbs energy of absorption of the molecules on the surface. And the idea of this work, as suggested by many researchers, is try to select optimum corrosion inhibitors based on their thermodynamics. And there's a large number of publications doing this, where they start with efficiency and get to delta G using this, these steps here. We shall explain in more detail what's done on the next slide. So here we have, this is our experimental data we've got initially from this uh, a particular system, example system. So this is an inhibition efficiency versus concentration inhibitor. And you can see it has this typical asymptotic type plot uh, for an organic corrosion inhibitor. We then, or they then, assume the efficiency is related to the coverage theta. That's the fractional surface coverage where theta, where for the maximum coverage equals one, okay, goes from zero to one. And so it's related by this, but basically multiplying by 100 but to theta gives you efficiency. So you can get out from the inhibition efficiency, you can get out easily, according to this work, you can get out the, the uh, theta, and that's plotted. Then the next stage is to use an absorption isotherm, okay, to explain the, uh, to model this uptake of the molecule, the coverage of the molecule. And here, the one I'm showing here is the Langmuir isotherm, where theta is related to the concentration inhibitor in bulk solution, CI, multiplied by the equilibrium constant for that reaction, all over this term here, which is one plus a similar term. And you get this behavior here, and then you fit these data. You know the corrosion inhibitor concentration, you know theta, so you can extract out equilibrium constant. And then you can use this standard equation to get out the standard Gibbs energy of absorption. And that's what's done. However, one issue is, and that's what I want to highlight, is this true? Is inhibition efficiency really equal to 100 times theta? This needs to be tested. And what we've done here, and in previous work, is to compare theta determined from inhibition efficiencies, as I've just explained, and theta determined more directly from XPS, basically the intensity or the relative intensity that peaks at the surface. We've done that for this molecule MBI on carbon steel in one molar hydrochloric acid, okay, after four hours immersion. On the left-hand side, the red data points show the efficiency. You see it's a highly efficient molecule. It's almost approaching 100%, about 98%. And this on the right-hand side shows the surface coverage determined from XPS. We've then translated both of those to thetas, to fractional surface coverages. So for both inhibition efficiency and also surface coverage here, where we assumed this coverage here is theta equals one. 
and we've replotted the data just shown here. They look approximately the same, but now we're plotting theta and theta XPS. And you can see already they look quite different. They do not look the same. So it seems to be that the theta from inhibition efficiency is not the same as theta from XPS, which is a much more direct measurement. We're really measuring how much is on the surface. So that does, does that make an impact on when you try to calculate delta G? So let's have a look at that. So on this, it's the same data. And what I'm plotting here now are the fits using the Langmuir isotherm to both uh, the efficiency theta and also the XPS theta coverage. And here are the numbers we get out, the K equilibrium and the delta G. You can see the K equilibrium is an order of magnitude higher essentially than for XPS. So the one for efficiency is at equilibrium, uh, equilibrium constant is at order of magnitude higher. And you also get a significantly lower uh, delta G, so minus 31 mark, compared to minus 25.5, and well outside the errors. So these numbers are significantly different. The key, so can we use theta XPS instead? Should we be using that? And maybe we can. However, there are concerns even about that and whether that number we've got out minus 25.5 is reliable. And I'll just explain why. So if you look at this equation, this is a Langmuir isotherm, but if you use this equation, you have to demonstrate adherence to these following criteria so you can apply it. The maximum absorbate coverage needs to be one, so model air. The dynamic equilibrium has to be achieved, so we don't know the first one exactly. As regards to dynamic equilibrium, actually in, in corrosion is never strictly a dynamic equilibrium. There's at best a steady state condition. Whether that is okay, that's a matter of debate. But more importantly, all absorption sites are meant to be equivalent. That's unlikely because on a very rough surface, we're going to have steps, terrace sites. So all these sites are going to be quite different. And also, you, do, you cannot have any absorbate-absorbate interactions during the, uh, <clears throat> during, when they're absorbing on the surface, when they're forming an overlay on the surface. And if these criteria are met, you cannot apply this this equation, this Langmuir isotherm. And essentially, when people are doing this, no one is checking whether this works, even for the XPS. I cannot really say whether we fit these criteria in our work. So I would be very dubious about using this, even if you had XPS. So just to summarize, I'd like to say the validity of, of inhibition efficiency being proportional to theta cannot, cannot be guaranteed. OK, how do we guarantee that? That's a tricky thing. So therefore, the accuracy of the delta G, the standard uh, Gibbs energy of absorption is questionable, even if you use a more direct measure. So I think, as I say here, the question, I really question the utility of this approach to advancing corrosion inhibitor selection. And just to convince anyone who's wavering, I'd like to show this. So we have said in some other work, OK, so we accept that delta G isn't perfect, but we can use it as a description. Maybe it's not the value is not really delta G, but it's a quant semi quantitative descriptor of the absorption. And we've looked in the literature for all the for as many delta Gs as we could find in acidic conditions for different inhibitors and plotted optimum corrosion efficiency. So that's between 90 and 100 here versus delta G of absorption, the standard Gibbs energy going from minus 15 to minus 40. And that's the typical range you find in these publications. And what we were, what we were thinking we would see, there would be some correlation between the inhibition efficiency and delta G. But you can see here, it's simply a scatter plot. So how can you expect to use these values of delta G, even if they have some value at all, of picking out good corrosion inhibitor? Because there doesn't seem to be any way of doing it from this work. So I think this is... This is a rabbit hole that we should avoid going forward because I think there's not so much use in it. Finally, if I do, I still have a little bit of time. Yes, I believe so. Feel free. Yeah. Thank you. So I would just like to uh, make some comments on green corrosion inhibitors. So, what is a green corrosion inhibitor? So I think that's just quite confusing to start off with. 
is it something that's, and I think this more sustainable or and more environmentally friendly going forward? So it's not as toxic to the environment, for example, and also to humans. So I think that's, we can accept that as a, a vague definition of green corrosion inhibitors. And there's various, there's a big activity in looking for green corrosion inhibitors. And there's various sources that people suggest, and that's just highlight here, such as using ionic liquids, uh, expired drugs, and other, and maybe biopolymers, etc. However, one thing that's really active is natural products, so plant extracts in particular. So we've focused on this. We haven't done any actual experimental work, but we reviewed the literature on this. Uh, this was my MSc project uh, from Anna and Moreno in 2021 because of COVID. Uh, actually, she was stuck in Spain. So instead of doing a practical project, we reviewed the literature on these natural product corrosion inhibitors from 2000 to 2020. We focused on, trimmed it down, looking at any acidic solution and the substrate is either carbon steel or iron. What this plot shows is number of papers. So we've used the web of science for this and we've looked for the terms corrosion inhibitors and green and acid. And you can see there's an increasing number of papers, up to 270 papers in 2020 that fulfill these criteria. Then we've looked in these papers by hand to determine which of those papers, or Anna did, I didn't do any of this. Uh, Anna looked to determine which of these papers were really about natural products. And you can see those, those are the pink columns. You can see there's significantly less going 79, 61 in the last, in 2020. Then we've looked, so we've said, okay, we have these natural product corrosion inhibitors, What's their performance? And I've said before that over 95% is considered a good inhibitor. So we use that as a criteria cutoff point and looked at which inhibitors exceeded 95%. So technically they have a chance of succeeding. That was the idea. So you can see there's only 20 of those in, in 2020, considering there's still quite a lot of papers. What's particularly worrying in some respects is the fact that over from 2009 to 2020, although there's a significant increase in total number of studies, actually the number of molecules that perform well aren't, isn't really improving very much. And so it seems to show a lack of systematics in searching for these molecules, but more sort of random choice. So even if you can get these molecules to work, to have a high inhibition efficiency, there's a whole load of other commercialization barriers. So for instance, what about mass production? Most people, they're just doing this in the lab. They picked a few leaves, for example. How are you going to mass produce this? Will, and what's the cost and the profits? So I give this classic example. I went to a conference, a number, I think it was Yoko a number of years ago now, where people were looking at uh, strawberries as a corrosion inhibitor, and they performed okay. However, there doesn't seem to be any commercial drive to use strawberries. You'd be much more better off selling them at Wimbledon with cream than ever using them from corrosion inhibitors. So I think that's a dead end. Also, there's significant questions about toxicity and biodegradability. Essentially, in about one paper that we reviewed, did anyone mention biodegradability in anything else? but a qualitative sense. They mention the word, but they don't actually test whether their molecules are either toxic or biodegradable. There's also significant regulatory hurdles to overcome, which I'm sure many from industry are much more experienced than me about. There's also the life cycle greenness. So it's not just the uh, product itself, but what about the bio size of being used to grow it, the energy used to grow it? And all of this needs to be considered whether this is really a green corrosion inhibitor, a green natural product that can be used. So I would suggest in terms of these natural product corrosion inhibitors, so CI NAT as we call them, there's been not really much progress and success today. There's numbers of papers out there, but they don't seem to be progressing anywhere fast. I think a more systematic uh, approach is required to selection of candidates. And also we need to think below, beyond laboratory testing to look at these commercialization barriers. There's no point just doing more and more tests on various natural products without thinking about how we're going to scale up these. 
One particular interesting uh, point could be, I think this is much more chance of working is waste products okay, of natural waste products. So for example, I've seen papers working on coffee grinds, shown this little image here, where they could be used because it's a waste product, they could be harvested and processed for corrosion inhibition. There might be other barriers there, but they seem to perform well. So you have a much more chance of waste products than for instance, using strawberries. So finally, I'd just like to bring everything to a close with a few take home messages. I hope I've shown you with our interface characterization work that we can start to try to understand what's going on at the molecular level for these corrosion inhibitors. And by that, hopefully we can then try to have a more knowledge-based selection of corrosion inhibitors for particular acids, for example, where we show in hydrochloric or sulfuric acid, the uh, interaction with the interface is quite different. I, I question the value of uh, absorption of thermodynamics and whether that's a way forward, because there seems to be many issues there. And also to suggest that for green corrosion inhibitors, in particular natural product corrosion inhibitors, we must, we must uh, approach in a much more systematic fashion to get value out of this work and to move that area forward. So finally, I'd just like to uh, give a couple of acknowledgements to Axa Nobel and Nurion for funding the project for collaboration at the University of Manchester, and also the M4D Doctoral Training Centre for Studentships for Kieran, and also Michael, who was also involved in the work. And I'd like to thank you for listening and any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation. So um, I'll ask the audience if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A session. Um, for now, if we can list, limit it to two questions per participant, uh, that would be ideal. Um, but now I'll, I'll start off with a question. So um, typically um, industrial corrosion inhibitors tend to be made of um, multiple components. Um, your research tends to have um, single components, how, how do they correlate to what we're getting commercially? All right, that, that's a great point. So, and I think it's true that they, yeah, commercial products are um, multi-component. Uh, however, we need to start somewhere. So if we use real formulation of multi-components, well, I suggest we get pretty spectra, for instance, XPS, but the chance of interpreting them would be minimal. So what we need to do now is add to the, uh, solution. So for instance, we know how it works in hydrochloric acid. What happens if we add some other components there and see what the change is? This is where we're at and we want to move towards more complexity. I would agree it's important. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, so uh, first question we have is an anonymous one and it goes, um, quite often efficiency and availability of inhibitor is mixed up. Any guidance on this misinterpretation? Yeah, so Efficiency, of course, is a property of the molecule. So how well it's working in terms of reducing the corrosion. Availability is an engineering issue. It's basically the amount of time you can dose. Uh, when I'm teaching it, actually that's true, it is mixed up. So when I teach it to my uh, MSc students, there's sometimes a bit of confusion. And by doing examples, we try and get around that. But it's, it, I agree sometimes it's a bit difficult to explain the difference between the two. But uh, I think only by reading and making sure you understand that one is basically a property of the molecule and the other is a, it's an engineering issue. And of course, in these experiments here, we're not looking at availability at all because we just add the inhibitor to the system and it's a static and not flowing system. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Okay, uh, next question we have is from Musen. It says, when testing OMID in hydrochloride, is it under static conditions or dynamic? Any difference uh, in CMC expected? It, it, it is under uh, static conditions. So we do all our measurements under static conditions. Uh, and then is it is anything, uh, if, I'm not sure there'll be any real difference in the CMC expected under static, under dynamic conditions. I think they'd have to be very, very uh, uh, extreme flowing conditions for that to be an issue. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, next, we have another one from Lucent. It says, any chance of elemental sulfur deposition on H2SO4? Uh, what's the best technique to characterize associated elemental sulfur, if any? Yeah, so with the XPS, sorry, if I can go back, which I didn't comment on. If 
I can get to it just one second. So this, these species here, they might be related to elemental sulfide species on the surface, these smaller ones here, which might be either contamination of sulfuric acid. I'd be surprised if it's if it's decomposition of the sulfate. The sulfate is pretty stable, so I was a bit surprised that was here, but we do see it. And also, to be honest, we don't measure uh, in the corroded case, we didn't focus on the sulfur. Uh, area in such detail so this sort of level of peak we wouldn't see in the overview spectra so they may also be there as well so i think they are there but whether that's from the sulfuric acid that's a bit unknown i would suggest okay thanks for that uh next uh, clarification we have from peter brown relating to an earlier question so peter says uh, bp has good guidance on this interesting to see what i say um so i guess that's related to um the question on uh, availability and efficiency. Perfect. Uh, next, um, a comment, uh, great presentation and nice work. So thank you there, Mehdi. Uh, next, we have a question from Elizabeth. Uh, do you see a way forward for including your surface characterization results to the machine learning research branch in the near future? I, I, I think that, to be honest, I think that's difficult because of course, the machine learning re requires really high throughput to generate a large data set. And currently, we're nowhere near uh, a state of high throughput for surface characterization. For instance, to do the OMID on the hydrochloric acid, uh, to get the state of the molecule, this took over a year to, to realize it was these two singly proteins. It sounds very simple when I talk, well, relatively simple when I talk about it. We didn't realize there was five peaks. You can also fit that with three peaks in a consistent fashion. But we didn't understand that. It was only, we, I, which I didn't explain here, we also measured the, mult, the head group, a thick layer of the head group to get some idea of the XPS from that, and then transfer that knowledge to, to this system. So I would say, sorry, in terms of going forward with uh, machine learning, I think we just can't output the data fast enough. Uh, I think there's other issues actually, even, so machine learning typically requires large data sets, but I'm not sure there's big enough data sets for these inhibitors already. And maybe there's a lot of work just to be done on performance there. Yeah, you have to be careful if the, the data sets aren't large enough, you get overtraining, which will- Yes, exactly. Itself. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, next question we have is from uh, Mehdi. He says, is it possible to study and measure the corrosion inhibitor film thickness by XPS? Yeah, so we, we did, so for, we didn't do the thickness, but we did the coverage in this case. So from the XPS, so this MBI molecule, this mecaptobenzobenzolol, we did measure the surface coverage for that. Uh, you can, there was a technical reason why we couldn't do it for the OMID, because for the, uh, for the mecaptobenzimidazole, we measured at two different angles, uh, and that allows us to determine more precisely uh, what the surface coverage is, uh, which is essentially a measurement of thickness. But for the uh, but for the OMID, there was a technical issue where we couldn't measure the other angle uh, for various reasons. So we didn't explore the uh, quantitative coverage at that point. Makes sense. Okay, uh, next question we have. Uh, based on your experience, what inhibitor type are best represented by each of the different inhibitor models available when it comes to modeling performance? Mm. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure. So I think it, it boils down to, um, based on the various efficiency models available, which ones kind of correlate best with the different corrosion inhibitor types? I think that's difficult to say. I'm not really sure that I, I, I can answer that question. That is tricky to say, I would say. Experience type are best represented by each of the different. What inhibitor model do they, I'm not sure which model they're referring to. Maybe okay. they. We'll, uh, we'll clarify that one uh, later after the presentation. Um, okay, next we have uh, for sulfuric acids, does the inhibitor help build up the iron sulfate layer? And does the inhibitor bond with the sulfate layer or the underlying metal in gaps with the sulfate layer? So we can't, we don't, so we think the sulfuric acid, uh, we think the sulfuric acid layer will be there. I didn't show you uninhibited because we haven't done so much work on that, but we think the iron sulfate layer 
will be there even if it's uninhibited, but whether the molecule binds in between those, uh, between the uh, sulfate or on top of it, that's a bit difficult to say, but given the thickness, given that we have quite a thick layer, I'd be surprised that there's islands and the, and the molecules are be in between, because remember it's well inhibited. And so therefore somehow the, uh, the sulfate will also be coming off as ferric, as ferric sulfate will be the sort of corroding surface. So I think the inhibitor is directly interacting with the ferric sulfate, although we can't say directly from our measurements, we have no lateral idea. It's a good point. Okay. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Okay, uh, next we have, um, what are your thoughts on corrosion inhibits of persistence, uh, particularly as it relates to the dangerous versus non-dangerous corrosion inhibitors? So I think it's a, it's a very interesting idea. Uh, so area uh, persistence, which isn't really explored very much because if you look in most academic papers are focusing on increasing efficiency. And this is a very, or looking at, looking at as efficiency as the main indicator, because we already have very efficient inhibitors. So there's a very small window for improving, okay, maybe a higher temperatures, for example, but under standard conditions, we already have highly efficient inhibitors. So you're really on a, a very difficult uh, scenario when you're trying to improve that by selecting another inhibitor. Whereas persistency, I think there's a very long way to go. That's an area we should be particularly targeting. We have some ideas how we could target that to increase the persistency of molecules on the surface. So they have longer residency times. One thing to say is that you don't want potentially two persistent molecules because you might have gaps between the way you start getting uh, preferential corrosion. So you want a bit of dynamics, but if you could dose instead of continuously, say once a day or once a week, or a lower concentration, that would be commercially, you know, financially less money and also more environmentally sustainable. So I think persistency is a real push, area we should push forward with. True, very true. Okay, uh, next question. Um, will future research focus potentially on tailoring corrosion inhibitors to particular environments more precisely? I would hope so. Yes, I, I think this would be really good. So we've demonstrated there's a difference, you know, the molecule works in this case, well in both cases as it as it happens. But I think we should start to think about do some molecules work well with some other some acids and not so well with other acids, for example. And this would be a really interesting area where we can actually specify for the system rather than just being an acidic solution. Yeah, it'd certainly be an ideal place to be in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, we have um, what is the effect of temperature on corrosion inhibitor efficiency, and how can this be improved? So, usually, the effect of temp in many cases, the effect when you increase the temperature, the efficiency goes down, and particularly depend over 120 degrees. It, it, I think, and maybe people in the industry will correct me, you start to struggle to get inhibitors to work well at this point in general. Uh, but the efficiency generally goes down. And, there's, and there is ways you could, could think to influence, influence that parameter. Although I think it's more difficult than, uh, than persist, uh, addressing persistency. I think in a previous, I can't remember if the talk was in in February, where they were forming polymers or oligomers on the surface, which were more persistent at a higher temperature. So I think this is a way to go, for example. Okay, perfect. And just leading on from that, um, did you consider the effect of temperature in the absorption process? Is this an influential parameter? Yeah, no, we, in these experiments, we didn't. Uh, we did a bit for MBI uh, ages ago, but we haven't, we usually stay at stick at room temperature because our main focus is characterizing with the XPS. And so we could we could widen the parameter space, but we also have enough to do at room temperature currently. But in principle, we could work at higher, higher temperatures. Okay, perfect. Um, next question, hopefully it's a quick one. Uh, how is CMC determined? Uh, CMC was determined in this case using a, a tensiometer uh, where you uh, basically pull out the liquid and you, you, you form a, a drop and it determines how, how much tension there is at this point. So you have, get a plot and it, it decreases and then goes to flattens off. There's various ways of doing it, but that's one way. We also have tried dynamic light scattering to see the formation of the micelles. That is more tricky as it turns out. 
uh, and we used the surface tensiometer normally for these this work because it was straightforward to do. Yeah, makes sense. Keep it simple. Um, okay. Uh, next question, um, gentlemen, is wondering if any interface characterization studies have been done in the alkali condition, and if so, what were the findings? We haven't done any any in alkali condition, uh, and I, by other people have, and I can't quote what their findings are, but I'm sure other people have. But we we have we concentrate on acidic conditions. We've also done near neutral, but we completely different molecules. So with uh, inorganic molecules in near neutral. Okay, thanks. Um, next question: uh, Using neutralizer, using neutralizer as one of the corrosion inhibitor components. Between, oh no, sorry, that was just a lead on from the next one. Okay. Um, right. Next question is: Are there any developments in terms of in situ characterization rather than removing under in rec purge? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So let me just take it back uh, all the way back. So we're now you so the although I've talked about XPS, which was X issue. So you can also do what's called near ambient pressure XPS, where you and you can form a uh, for example, you can form a very thin layer of liquid. And we've done that to look at uh, corrosion where we're basically saturating the solution with CO2. Uh, and looking at intermediates there, and you could move on to doing thin layers of liquid with inhibitors in the in the solution as well. And we're looking at ways to do that. One problem is, from a practical point of view, it's not our nap; it's a user facility, and they're not very interested in, do, in putting in hydrochloric acid solutions in at the moment because it tends to corrode lots of the uh, other bits of the equipment. However, we do have other techniques. So, for instance, we're developing vibrational small frequency spectroscopy. And that's a nonlinear optical technique it involves lasers and it gives you vibrational information that is essentially interface specific. And you can look at absorbate chemistry and geometry. So, for instance, we look at the ordering of the CH3N groups on the tail groups of the molecules and see whether it's well ordered, laying flat, standing upright. And this you can truly do in situ. And we have measurements on that. I just didn't talk about that uh, today. Well, that sounds like some exciting piece of kit. So. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to hearing about that in the future. Okay. Um, next question is: um, Are you purging nitrogen when removing these preservation layers? Surely it is very difficult to ensure clean metal, so to speak. So, I would. I presume that's when we're removing it from the uh, solution. So the nitrogen is. We filled the glove box with nitrogen. We're flowing nitrogen to make sure the oxygen levels are really down. And we, when we remove the sample, we then blow the sample dry with nitrogen so we don't get any physical deposition on the surface. I wouldn't say they're clean. So that's why I try to avoid the word clean. They're oxide and salt free. So I, we try to avoid the, because also we have adventitious carbon building up on the surface as well. So they're not really clean, uh, but they're oxide and salt free because I, my background is in ultra high vacuum surface science where we really do make clean surfaces and these are not, clean but atomically clean in that manner. Okay. I think that and, I'm sorry. Uh, I think this is that. Yeah, yeah. And um, last question I have here is um, how does the resistance to corrosion inhibitor stripping in turbulent flows or high shear stress environments, how can that be improved? I'm I'm not sure it's such an it so I'm not sure that's a real issue. So I haven't really done work on that specifically, but other people who have done work demonstrate that really you're not, by the high flow, you're not really stripping the molecules because basically even in turbulent flow, you have a very thin layer that is, all, is essentially static in the interface. And if you do the various calculations, then uh, <clears throat> the basically the metal pipe falls to bits before the molecules fall off or similar. So the flow conditions have to be so violent. So this idea you're stripping the molecules with flow is, is almost certainly incorrect. There might be other issues with high flow rates as in getting the molecules to the surface and other such things, but stripping them I don't think is a real issue. Okay, perfect then. So um, that's, that's all our questions from, from the audience today. Um, any any further questions from the panel? 
Okay, if not, uh, thank you very much, and I'll hand you back to Ahmed. Thank you very much, Ali, for uh, taking all the questions. And again, thank you, Dr. Lancy, for this excellent presentation and very interesting topic. Uh, I'm taking the time answering all these questions in detail, like 20 plus questions. Uh, again, thanks everyone uh, for attending uh, today's webinar. Uh, just to remind you that uh, when you leave the webinar, there will be a short survey. Uh, please take time uh, to to uh, to fill the survey, especially if you are looking for a CPD certificate. Please make sure that you fill the survey and the and respond to the CPD question as yes and uh, enter your email address. Uh, as I mentioned before, the slides, the PDF version of the slides, will be on on the website, and the recording will be available on the YouTube channel. Uh, our next. Uh, presentation, uh, which will be hybrid webinar and uh, seminar in uh, Aberdeen, uh, will be by Preserve. Uh, and the topic is reducing the environmental footprint for surface preparation and coating application for onshore and offshore assets. Uh, that will be uh, at the same time and uh, last Tuesday of April, 26th of April in uh, juries in uh, city center Aberdeen. Uh, you will receive a, an announcement for the Zoom registration as well if you want to join online. And again, thanks a lot. Uh, have a good rest of the day or evening. Thanks again, Dr. Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Thanks all. Take care, stay safe. Bye now.